Okay. Today, we're going to continue with uh, the A Priesthood for Today series. Um, and I've titled this part, Melchizedek and the Letter to the Hebrews. Um, I did promise that at the beginning of this series, we'll end up tackling this topic. Uh, but I just wanted to lay some foundation. Um, and I did say that at first it may seem a bit um, like the, these things don't marry up, but that as we progress through this series, it will become evident why I did it this way. Um, just to quickly recap, what did we do in part one? The, that was the, so the first part was the need for judges and reproof. So we went through scripture to show that Scripture shows us we need leadership in place, and that leadership is there to meet out righteousness, right ruling, and to reprove the body, because we need reproof. The second part, I, uh, it was called two, the two priesthoods, and we showed that there was the Levitical priesthood, and that there were other priests, um, like David's sons, like Jethro, Moshe's father-in-law, like Melchizedek. Where did these fit? into the picture and we kind of delve into what it meant to actually be a priest what did a priest actually do and what what did we say that a priest acts as a mediator between people and between Yah and that a priest will uh, meet out righteousness and right ruling with that let's tackle today's topic so we'll start in Genesis 14, because this is the main text, where this is where Melchizedek first shows up. Verse 8, And the sovereign of Sodom, and the sovereign of Amorah, and the sovereign of Adma, and the sovereign of Tseboim, and the sovereign of Bela, that is Saul, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Sidim against Kedola Omer, and sovereign of Elam, and Tidal, sovereign of Goyim, and Amraphel, sovereign of Shinar, and Arioch, sovereign of Elisar, four sovereigns against five. And in the valley of Sidim had many tar pits, and the sovereigns of Sodom and Amorah fled and fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Amorah and all their food and went away. And they took Lot, Avram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and left. And one who had escaped came in and informed Avram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, brother of Aner, and they had a covenant with Avram. And when Avram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he and his servants divided against them by night and smote them and pursued them as far as Hobar, which is on the left of Damascus. So there's your original 300 story, right? 318. Um, so he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. And after his return from the defeat of Kedor Laomer, the sovereigns who were with him, the sovereign of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaweh, that is, the sovereign's valley. And Malkit Sedek, sovereign of Shalem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was the priest of the Most High El. Most people think that Melchizedek is a name. It's a title. It's actually a title. It's not a name of a... There, he wasn't born and his mother named him Melchizedek. It was a title. The Hebrew is Malki Tzedek. Now, Malki is the first person possessive form of Melech. So Melech means king. Malki means my king. And Tzedek means righteous or righteousness. So literally translated, my king is righteous, my righteous king... My king is righteousness, so, but it's a title. Let's remember that. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Avram of the Most High El, possessor of heavens and earth. And blessed be the Most High El, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. So let's look at this. Malkid Sedek, sovereign of Shalem, brought out bread and wine. Now, it's widely understood that Shalem was probably Jerusalem. There's general consensus throughout the ages for that. Um, 
Note the usage, though, of the past tense when describing how Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High El. Now, why is this important? Let's look at another passage, Genesis chapter 2. And Yah Elohim planted a garden in Eden to the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, Yah Elohim made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, with the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four river heads. The name of the first is the Pishon, not was Pishon. It is the one surrounding the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, and Bedellium is there, and the Shoham stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon, and it is the one surrounding the entire land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Hidekel. It is the one which goes towards the east of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, we still know where the Euphrates is. So here it says that he was the priest of the Most High El. The scripture, if you read the Genesis account, you have past tense, past tense, past tense. Then you have that little descriptive bit, which is present tense. And then it goes straight back to the past tense. The scripture knows when to differentiate between the two is the point that I'm trying to make. So when it says he was the priest of the Most High, this is past tense. This implies that the Melchizedek from Genesis 14 is not a priest anymore. He was He isn't now. This will make more sense as we go forward. So the problem with this topic is that we already have a lot of preconceived ideas as to the identity of Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek. And what I want us to do today is kind of look at the text honestly. And so right now, all we know is that Melchizedek was a high priest. Let's keep going. Now, what was the theme that preceded the entrance of Melchizedek in the narrative? Let's look. So verse 14, Avram had heard that his brother was taken captive. So he has to go and rescue Lot. And he and his servants divided against them by night, and they smote them and pursued them as far as Chobah, which is on the left of Damascus. And then Avram brought back all the goods and brought back uh, his brother Lot and his goods and the women and the men. So this is what precedes the entrance of Melchizedek. We have two themes in that passage. The release and return of property. So property had been taken. These kings had taken and taken the captives. Now, Avram came and liberated the captives. You're going to start, we're going to hear language that sounds familiar to us throughout today. The setting free of captives. So you have the setting free of captives and the release and return of property. What does that sound like? The Jubilee, thank you. It's exactly the Jubilee. In Leviticus 25.10, you shall set the 50th year apart and proclaim release throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It is a Jubilee for you. And each of you shall return to his possession and each of you return to his clan. So we all know what happened in the Jubilee, right? If you had sold uh, your land... Uh, say 10 years before the Jubilee, that land belonged to someone else. But at the Jubilee, you got your land back. All the debts were reset as well. You had a reset of debts every seven years. Servants were liberated. But at the Jubilee, you got your property back. So the, the central theme of the Jubilee is the setting free of captives and the return of property. Now, as we move forward, we're going to see the the topic of, topic of Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews is intrinsically linked to the Jubilee. Now, the concept of the Jubilee was not a new idea. It was actually, it had been around in the Middle East for quite a while before Yah made it uh, part of the Torah, so to speak. The biblical Jubilee laws were actually analogous to the royal pro- proclamations of the Sumerian Andururum, which means freedom, or the Akkadian Misharum, which means justice. That should sound similar to Mishpatim, the Hebrew Mishpat, which is the right rulings. These are attested to as early as the mid-third millennium BC in Mesopotamia and continue to be practiced throughout the ancient Near East into the Greco-Roman era, even. 
It's also known as establishing righteousness and establishing liberty. So this idea of that there would be a reset every so often. Now, in the ancient Near East, in the pagan nations, this was done when a king ascended to power. And the king, when ascending to power, he would establish righteousness to gain uh, the loyalty of his subjects and of the people. Yeah, established on a king's ascension to the throne. So what, they, what he would do when the king would become king, he would liberate those that had been falsely imprisoned. Those that had committed crimes, he'd put them in jail. He would set things straight to gain the favor of the people. The, um, when I was researching this, actually, um, this came up. You know the story of Daniel being thrown into the lion's den? And, uh, you know, the edict goes out and obviously the king can't go back on his word and he's really gutted, you know, oh, Daniel, I wish I could do something. And Daniel's like, oh, it's cool. You know, Yah will deliver me. Let's remember that he was recently appointed king. If he'd have been seen to go back on his decree, he would have been seen as weak. So it, this kind of ties into this. He would have, a lot of laws were put into place when a king established his reign. Now, we get this in the Hebrew Bible, in 2 Samuel 8, 15, and David reigned over all Israel, and David was doing right ruling and righteousness to all his people. He reigned them rightly. He did it fairly. In 1 Kings 10, this is Solomon, uh, and this is the Queen of Sheba speaking to Solomon, saying, Blessed be Yah, your Elohim, who delighted in you to put you on the throne of Israel, because Yah has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you sovereign to do right ruling and righteousness. So here we actually see what the function of a king is. is to do right ruling and right... is to oversee that the Torah is being kept in the land, not to rule in the sense that we think of it. It entailed, uh, the Jubilee entailed li liberation of slaves and prisoners, restoration of land to original owners, release of debts, rectification of economic injustices, the restoration of temples, and punishment of the oppressors. And the kings would do this to establish their rule at the beginning of their reign. So let's look at Melchizedek. He had two interesting features. Everyone can guess what are the two interesting features of Melchizedek? Priest and a king. Melchizedek, king or sovereign of Shalem, brought our bread and wine. Now he was the priest of the Most High El. Do we see this combination of priest and king elsewhere in Scripture? Yes, we do. And that's in Psalm 110. It's the only place we see the office combined. Yah said to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So sitting at the right hand is it's almost an idiomatic expression for giving someone authority and rule. Yah's giving the rule to this subject. Yah sends your mighty scepter out of Zion. Again, the scepter is a sign of authority and kingship. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people volunteer in the day of your might, in the splendors of your set apartness. From the womb, from the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Yah has sworn and does not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is going to be important, this being a priest forever. Re remember, how long was, when we read in Genesis 14, Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High, which implies he isn't anymore. This person is forever. Yari, your right hand, shall smite sovereigns in the day of his wrath. He judges among the nations. He shall fill the nations with dead bodies. He shall crush the head over the mighty earth. He drinks of the stream by the wayside. Therefore, he does lift up the head. So let's look at this. You're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We touched on this a bit last week. So this is the Hebrew for you are a priest forever. Ata kohen leolam al divrati, malki tzedek. So this here, al divrati, is what is translated as the order of. Is the better translation is you are a priest forever by my decree, O Melchizedek. So here where you see... Divrati, so the Dalit, the Beit, and the Reish make the word Davar, which means word. So Divrati 
is the, that makes it first person possessive, my word. So you are a priest forever by my word, O righteous king. This is important. 82, sorry, 81 of the 82 occurrences of this divrati and its variations are translated as told, promised, declared, spoken, or told. Every, it's to do with speech and declaration. Guess where the one is, where is this is uh, translated as order? Right here, in Psalm 110. The implication of this is that there is no Melchizedekian priesthood, like an order of, like a, almost like a guild. We think of a, the order of, like a, an organization almost. All this says is that Melchizedek is a priest forever by the decree of Yah. This, this idea of where it's an order of something, as in an organization, it actually comes from the Greek being translated into English. And as we're going to see in the second half of today, is that the Greek is actually closer to the Hebrew meaning than we realize. But because let, let's read the verse. It says, you are a priest forever by my decree, O Melchizedek. There's no order of in there. It just means that Melchizedek is a priest. Again, we're inserting this into the text. This will become clearer later on in the teaching when we tackle the book of Hebrews. So just hold that thought. Let's keep going. Another interesting allusion in this psalm is this, that he shall crush the head over the mighty earth. Where else do we read of someone crushing the head of something? Genesis, yes. I put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall crush his heel. So there's this inference here. Now, the, the ancient Hebrews would have picked up on this. Let's keep going. So let's, um, Melchizedek in second temporal literature. So second temporal literature is the intertestamental period. Uh, this is where your apocryphas, Maccabees and so forth were written. Now, the Genesis Apocryphon, Philo, and Josephus all focus upon the hospitality that Melchizedek provides Avram. That's all they focus on. And they add in that Melchizedek also brought the food to Avram's men. So this is what the literature of the day was uh, saying about Mel the Melchizedek of Genesis 14. That, that, that needs to be pointed out. According to Josephus, Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem, the leader of the Canaanites, and the first to serve as a priest before God. Just interesting. This is what they believed in the day. Philo, the apostolic constitutions, and the Targum Neophyte all state that Melchizedek was a high priest. So this is in the Genesis, it just says a priest, but they, they go to the level of high priest. 11Q13, so this is a Dead Sea Scroll, and we're going we're to unpack this. And 4Q401, Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice, portray Melchizedek as an angelic being. So this will make more sense, actually, as we progress through the teaching. But I just want you guys to kind of be aware of the theology that was going on in those days. So let's look at the Melchizedek Scroll. Um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls is a document called 11Q Melchizedek, and it dates from around 100 to 50 BC. In that sort, so this is before Messiah came on the scene. From this, we can actually gain great insight into the eschatological view of the people in those days. Now, this is from the Qumran community, and the Qumran, they're thought to be the Essenes, uh, that Josephus mentions, there were largely the original priests that had been disenfranchised because by this time the priesthood is corrupt. It's now uh, you buy your way into it and you do it by lineage as opposed to how it was prescribed in Torah. So this is the community. Um, th their doctrines are actually quite interesting. They were steeped in dualism, which is really interesting. Um, whilst this not scripture... It is cultural context. And we're going to see a lot of crossing over, actually, between 11Q Melchizedek and the book of Hebrews. So let's look at We're going to read through it. Um, and concerning what Scripture says, 
In this year of Jubilee, you shall return every one of you to your property. And what is also written, and this is the manner of the remission, every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against a neighbor, not exacting it of a neighbor who is a member of the community because God's remission has been proclaimed. The interpretation is that it applies to the last days and concerns the captives, just as Isaiah said, to proclaim the jubilee to the captives. Now, the whole of 11Q Melchizedek is about interpreting Isaiah 61 and then interpreting it through that lens. Whose teachers have been hidden and kept secret, even from the inheritance of Melchizedek. For, and they are the inheritance of Melchizedek, who will return them to what is rightfully theirs. He will proclaim to them the Jubilee, thereby releasing them from the debt of all their sins. This word will be thus come in the first week of the Jubilee period that follows nine Jubilee periods. Then the Day of Atonement shall follow at the end of the tenth Jubilee period when he shall atone. So this Melchizedek figure is seen as the one doing the atoning for all the sons of light and the people who are predestined to Melchizedek. Now, when was the Jubilee announced? On Yom Kippur. So we're going to see that the two are linked. For this is the time decreed for the year of Melchizedek's favor. Now, this is a quote of Isaiah 61. Go read what it says in Isaiah 61 there. It says the, the, of the year of Yah's favor. So we actually have a substitution going on. Uh, very similar to how in the Targums you had Yah substituted with the word of Yah. And here we see a similar thing, but they're using Melchizedek. The year of Melchizedek's favor and for his host, together with the holy ones of God, for a kingdom of judgment, just as it is written concerning him in the songs of David. Elohim has taken his place in the council of God. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. So this group in the Qumran, this Melchizedek figure, is seen as the head of the divine council. Scripture also says about him, over it take your seat in the highest heaven. Elohim will judge the people that they're elevating this figure to Elohim status. Much like the word is elevated to Yah. Concerning what scripture says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Salah. The interpretation applies to Belial. So this is what, Chris, Belial is the Jewish equivalent of Satan, essentially. Uh, this applies to Belial and the spirits predestined to him because, of all of the, because all of them have rebelled, turning from God's precepts and so becoming utterly wicked. Therefore, Melchizedek will thoroughly prosecute the vengeance required by God's statutes. We're, we're going to see that they saw, this Melchizedek figure was seen as like the vice regent almost, like the right hand of Yah. It, it, it should sound familiar in that day, he will deliver them from the power of Belial and from the power of all the spirits predestined to him. Allied with him will be all the righteous divine beings. This is that which all the divine beings. By the way, when you see dot, 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 it means the scroll, it, it was torn basically. This visitation is the day of salvation that he has decreed through Isaiah the prophet concerning all the captives inasmuch as scripture says how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace who brings good news who announces salvation who says to Zion your Elohim reigns. This is the scripture's interpretation. The mountains are the prophets. They who were sent to proclaim God's truth and to prophesy to all Israel. And the messenger is the anointed of the spirit of whom Daniel spoke after the 62 weeks. An anointed one shall be cut off. So now he's linking this messenger to the anointed of Daniel. Bear that in mind because he says, the messenger who brings good news, who announces salvation, is the one of whom it is written to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. So the, the author of this scroll is saying, in their theology, this Melchizedek figure is being substituted, is being put in the place of Elohim, 
much like the word, and they're saying that this is the anointed one from Daniel. And who, who do we believe is the anointed one from Daniel? Yeshua. Like, so far, all of these things we would attribute to Yeshua. This scripture's interpretation, he is to instruct them about all the periods of history for eternity in the statutes of truth. Oh, we see now he's meeting out righteousness and right ruling. Dominion that passes from Belial and returns to the sons of light. By the judgment of God, just as it has been written concerning him, who says to Zion, your Elohim reigns. Zion is the congregation of all the sons of righteousness who uphold the covenant and in turn and turn from walking in the way of the people. Your Elohim is Melchizedek who will deliver them from the power of Belial. So this is, the, this, is this document written 100 to 50 BC. So where is the author getting the idea of an eschatological jubilee? So what I mean is an ultimate fulfillment of a jubilee at the end of time. So the Septuagint, everyone knows what the Septuagint is. You get the same in the Hebrew, by the way. You get common words. It's just because we have an English translation. We, we don't get it. The Septuagint for a release is aphesis, which means to release from the bondage or imprisonment. The forgiveness or pardon of sins. As we're going to see, we have a, an erroneous understanding of what it means to be forgiven from sin in terms of the mechanics of it. Now, in Leviticus 25.10, um, in the Septuagint version, uh, where it says, you shall proclaim release, you have this word, aphesis. You shall set the 50th year apart, proclaim release, proclaim aphesis. Throughout all the land to all its inhabitants, it's a jubilee. You get it in Deuteronomy 15. At the end of every seven years, you make a release, an aphesis of debts. And this is the word of release. Every creditor is to release what he has loaned to his neighbor. He does not require it of his neighbor or his brother because it is called the release of Yah. In Isaiah 61, what we've just covered... In the Melchizedek scroll, the spirit of the master Yah is upon me because Yah has anointed me to bring the good news to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim release. In the Septuagint, it's all the same word or derivatives of, and you get the same in the Hebrew. The Hebrew is all the same similar words. So we now have the Jubilee of Leviticus and Deuteronomy being linked to Isaiah 61. And Isaiah 61 is clearly talking of end times. So this is where the writer from 11Q Melchizedek can get this theology that there's going to be an eschatological jubilee. And what I mean is a jubilee at the end of time. To proclaim the acceptable year of Yah, the day of vengeance of our Elohim, to comfort all who mourn. Who quoted this passage? Yeshua in the synagogue. The writer of 11Q Melchizedek portrays Melchizedek as an angelic being who initiates an eschatological jubilee that releases people from their sins rather than economic debts. Now, the, their understanding is that whoever this figure was, it wasn't the Melchizedek from Genesis 14. Genesis 14, the dude in Genesis 14 was a type and shadow because he was a king and a priest. This agent of salvation is enormously exalted and has names generally reserved to Elohim alone applied to him, including an actual substitution for the divine name and put in Melchizedek. There's a clear substitution there. This sounds a lot how the messenger of Yah and the word of Yah are used interchangeably with Yah himself. We did this in the Divinity Unveiled teaching. He is also portrayed as carrying out judgment upon the wicked, something that the Tanakh associates with the arm of Yah. I've got a couple of scriptures here on the arm. My righteousness is near, my deliverance shall go forth, and my arms judge peoples. Coastlands wait upon me, and for my arm they wait expectantly. Now in Isaiah 53, it tells you who has believed our report and to whom was the arm of Yah revealed. For he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or splendor that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. 
despised and rejected by men, a man of pains, knowing sickness, and as one from whom the face is hidden, being despised, and we did not consider him. So we would say that Yeshua is the arm of Yah. So what this 11 Q Melchizedek, this scroll, what, we, what they call Melchizedek, we would attribute to Yeshua. This also sounds a lot how the New Testament writers speak of Yeshua and all the events surrounding his return in glory when he comes to judge the nations. Now, the author portrays Melchizedek as a divine king priest, a king in that he judges nations and a priest in that he provides atonement for the righteous. 11Q Melchizedek gives us a cultural context. So just this sort of ideology that was going on in that time. Because a lot of people, they read the Tanakh, and then they get to the New Testament, and it feels like a really big jump. Like, well, where did these demons all of a sudden come from? And where's this theology coming from? And actually, by studying the literature of that time, you can actually see a transition going on. So with, this is all background for the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews is almost like a weird little gem in the midst of, a, of the New Testament. It, it's a very different flavor. Interestingly, it's the only book in the Brit Hadashah that portrays Yeshua as a priest. It's the only book. In Revelation, he's portrayed as a king. But it's Hebrews that gets the priestly thing. It is also one of the most mistranslated books in the Bible. I mean, seriously, there's uh, tense changes, there's words inserted, there's some taken out. It's, it, it's a bit of a mashup, actually. It is thought that this book was written between mid-50s AD to the upper limit of 96 AD. However, multiple references of the Levitical priesthood still being in operation would imply a pre-70 AD composition, i.e. before the destruction of the temple because it speaks of the Levitical priesthood still being in operation. There would have been, now, okay, context. Because people think that the book of Hebrews was written to do away with the Levitical sacrifices, to do away with the Torah. This is the standard Christian teaching. Uh, actually, that was not the case. There would have been great distress in the believing community in the run-up to 70 AD for many reasons. The priesthood was corrupt. Like, it wasn't a legit, the, part of the official priesthood, there were still some legitimate priests in there. Like, we, we know of John the Baptist's father. John the Baptist's father was a legitimate priest, and he was still serving in the temple. But we know that the high priestly office was corrupt. You bought your way into it, basically. Uh, it also, if you were good friends with the Roman government, let's remember that Rome is ruling at this time. So the priesthood is corrupt. The Yom Kippur ceremony had not been accepted by Elohim for 40 years up until the destruction of the temple. Now we get the, the Mishnah rights of this and they openly admit that the, the Yom Kippur was not accepted. So the red ribbon didn't turn white. Uh, also, there's talk of, you, you know how you had these massive temple doors? They would fling themselves open for no reason. Now these doors would take many men to open and close. And the, the, to, you read in the Mishnah actually that they, they know the temple is going to be destroyed because of the doors being flung open and they link it to a prophecy in the Tanakh. Also, the menorah kept going out supernaturally. They, made, they, would, they tried their best to keep the menorah lit perpetually and it kept going out all the time. So, uh, th and you know how you had the, t the lot, you know, which goat is for Yah, which goat is for Azazel? It was considered favorable that the lot fell in the right hand. For, for 40 years, it fell in the left. So, it, th they, they were quaking because they're like, why is Yah not accepting? Well, what happened around that time? 40 years back from the destruction of the temple. Right, we had Yeshua being crucified, dying and being risen again. And I would put out there that it was because of that, that the Yom, because they didn't accept that sacrifice, did they? They didn't accept Messiah. Therefore, the Yom Kippur ceremony, Yah didn't accept it. And they knew that they, he did, wasn't accepting it, but they couldn't put it together. The temple was about to be destroyed. Now, we think of, well, well, yeah, it was corrupt, it's a good riddance, right? 
This was the center of people's life, like physically and mentally. Their whole relig- their religion, their faith was centered around that temple. We know that the, the early believers still went to the temple. Paul performed Nazarite vows. The, the apostles were there for Shavuot. The, and the temple was seen as Yah's favor upon the people. Now, that was, they knew it was going bye-byes. They knew that. Rome was starting to surround and get awfully close. So literally, their whole life is about to be flushed away in front of them. And there's nothing they can do about that. The purpose of the book of Hebrews was to provide certainty for a wavering community whose world was about to be shattered in order that they would maintain their endurance. People would have, some people would have lost their faith because of the temple being destroyed. That's how serious it was. It was not written with the intention of engaging a polemic against Judaism or to do away with the Levitical system. Now, I I use the term Judaism loosely here because Judaism now is very, very, very different to what it is back then. Part of the reason for writing this letter was to show the superiority of Yeshua's priesthood over that of the Levitical priesthood because their whole faith is centered around this. Another reason for writing the letter is to assure his audience that regardless of whether or not the Yom Kippur was accepted in Jerusalem, we have a high priest in the heavenly temple who has already provided atonement once and for all. The author shows how all of this can work within the confines of Torah. This is the important thing because it's all well and good saying this, but does Torah approve? And this is what the the writer goes to great lengths to show. So with that, we're not going to read the whole book, but we're going to go over the main parts of it, and we're just going to pull it apart. So Hebrews 1, this chapter is, shows the superiority of Yeshua, even over that of the angels of heaven. Elohim, having of old spoken in many portions and many ways to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by the Son, whom he has appointed heir of all, through whom he also made the ages, who being in the brightness of the esteem and the exact representation of his substance, and sustaining all by the word of his power, having made a cleansing for us of our sins through himself, sat down at the right hand of the greatness on high, having become so much better than the messengers, as he has inherited a more excellent name than them. For to which of the messengers did he ever say, you are my son, today I have brought you forth. And again, I shall be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the messengers of Elohim do reverence to him. Now, around this time, there was a lot of angelology going on, like people were almost deifying angels to the levels of God. So this is hinted at in the book of Hebrews. that He's saying, look, no, Messiah is above all this. And the messengers indeed, of the messengers indeed, he says, who is making his messengers spirits and his servants a flame of fire. But to the son, he says, your throne, O Elohim, is forever and ever. A scepter of straightness is is the scepter of your reign. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Hmm. Because of this, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Master, did found the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. This is speaking of the Son. The author of Hebrews is equating Yeshua to the word of Yah right here. Just, I'll... I'll, I'll The book of Hebrews is putting Yeshua in a very lofty position. The writers of the Brit Hadashah clearly thought of Yeshua as divine and responsible for the creation. They they saw the word as the co-regent of Elohim. I don't want to get into a divinity thing, but it's just because I see a lot of things that Yeshua was just a man. The book of Hebrews is saying that he was present at the beginning of time. They're creating. So I just want to throw that out there. And they shall perish, the, the heavens of the creation, but you remain, and they shall grow all grow old like a garment, and like a mantle you shall fold them up, and they shall be changed, but you are the same, and your years shall not fail. 
We read elsewhere that Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and his years shall not fail. And to which of the messengers did he ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all serving spirits sent out to attend those who are about to inherit deliverance? So Hebrews 1, putting Yeshua on the throne above everything. Hebrews 2, this chapter shows how Yeshua had to become a man before being glorified so that he would know our sufferings, making him a compassionate and understanding high priest. I'm, I'm only taking the main points out of Hebrews, by the way. Therefore, verse 14, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself similarly shared in the same, so that by means of his death, he might destroy him having the power of death. That is that, look, part of the reason Yeshua had to become a man is to do with the laws of the Redeemer. In the Torah, it says that only the family of the offended party can, um, can redeem that person, which means that Yeshua had to become a man to redeem man. He had to be of the same blood. To destroy him having the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who throughout life were held in slavery by fear of death. Again, this is Jubilee language, to set the captives free. They, we miss this. We just think, oh, he's setting them free. They would have got these overtones. For doubtless he does not take hold of messengers, but he does take hold of the seed of Abraham. So in every way, he had to be made like his brothers in order to become a compassionate and trustworthy high priest in matters related to Elohim to make atonement for the sins of the people. I love the way Curtis puts this, is that he, Elohim is the ultimate CEO with the mop in his hands, taking accountability and responsibility for everything. For in what he had suffered, himself being tried, he is also able to help those who are tried. So when you say, oh, it's too difficult, oh, are you sure as they're saying, I know, I know what this feels like, I've been there. Okay, Hebrews 3. This chapter shows how we need to obey Elohim. Otherwise, we will share the same fate as those of the wicked generation that fell in the wilderness. Therefore, as the set-apart spirit says, today if you hear his voice, now this is quoting Psalm 95, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they have always go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. This is he's speaking of people that were given the Torah, by the way, and they didn't know his ways. This means that knowledge of Torah does not mean you know his ways. As I swore in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Okay, so what is this wrath contextually? just in what we've covered so far. But, all right, I'm going to lead, because right now, contextually, all, it's, all we know is that this is about the generation that fell in the wilderness, and then he speaks about a rest. Let's keep, what I'm supposing is that this was entering the land. That first generation were not allowed to enter the land. Now, I'm going to cover this because of a particular teaching that's out there. Let's keep going. Look out, brothers, lest there be in any of you a wicked heart of unbelief in falling away from the living Elohim. But encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceivableness of sin. For we have become partakers of Messiah if we hold fast to the beginning of our trust firm to the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Was it not all who came out of Mitzrayim, led by Moshe, so the first generation? And with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest, but to those who did not obey? The context is clearly telling us that the rest is entering into the promised land. Let, let, let's... Keep with the text. 
So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Disobedience is equated to unbelief. I just wanted to point that out. Those who say, I believe, but do not obey him, are like the demons. who They, they believe that Elohim is one, but they shouldn't. So unbelief, disobedience, for that generation meant they didn't enter into his rest, into the promised land. Again, the rest is entering into the promised land. Now, we're going to see that the writer of Hebrews is doing a type and shadow here. So chapter 4 shows us that we have heard the same good news as those in the wilderness. And that we must do our utmost to not follow the example of that wicked generation. Lest we not enter into his rest. The author also reminds us that our high priest is able to sympathize with us if... If we do our utmost to hold fast the confession of faith. This is key. That he shows you, he will sympathize with you if you try your hardest. We get the same with parents and children. Or just any situation. You're more likely to show sympathy to someone if they genuinely tried. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering into his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it who who, is this after the death burial and resurrection of messiah it is this means that and who is he speaking to is he speaking to the pagans no this means that we can still fall short of it this is what the text is saying it's it's scary Thank you. There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. And this becomes apparent as we keep going. For indeed, the good news was brought to us as well as to them. So again, we need to know what what the gospel is, the good news, because apparently we've heard the same thing that what they heard at Sinai. What was given at Mount Sinai? Torah. How is the Torah good news? What does the Torah do? It changes you from who you were into what he is. That's good news. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Because not having been mixed with belief in those who heard it. What did we just say that belief was? Obedience. They didn't mix it with obedience. Belief, obedience. This is why that good news did not profit them. There's no point in Yah giving you his Torah, you not obeying it, it's not going to profit you. In fact, it will do you harm. For we who have believed do enter into that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. And yet his works have come into being from the foundation of the world. For somewhere he has thus said about the seventh day, and Elohim rested on the seventh day from all his works. And in this again, if they shall enter into my rest. So he's going to make a, a, a parallel here. People use this passage to say we don't need to keep Shabbat. This is where they go. This is why I labored a bit. What is the rest? Because the inference is that now we have accepted Messiah, we've entered into a spiritual Shabbat. This idea of Jesus is my Sabbath. Therefore, because I have accepted Jesus, I am now in the, in the spiritual Sabbath, therefore I do not have to keep the Sabbath. Let's keep reading on and remember the context so far, that the rest is about entering into the promised land. It's about, that's what it's talking about. Since then, it remains for some to enter into it. Was this written after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Messiah? Yes, which that means it still remains for some to enter into the rest, which means that Messiah's death has nothing to do with entering into that rest. Now, what was the rest? Entering the promised land. What are we going to enter into? The promised land, right? The kingdom that we can still apparently fall short of. This means that the idea of Jesus is my Sabbath, completely erroneous, is to take one little bit, insert your own thinking into it, and just, yeah. (laughs) 
since it remains for some to enter into it, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter in because of disobedience. Now, so it tells you, earlier it said because of unbelief, now it's disobedience. Same thing. He again defi- So this implies that if it remains for some to remain, uh, enter into that rest, that means that if we disobey, we do not enter into that rest like the wicked generation. He again defines a certain day today, saying through David so much later as in after the events of the promised land that as it has been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Yehoshua had given them rest, he would have not spoken of another day after that. The writer is saying that the first generation did not enter into Elohim's rest. Now, did the second generation? Right, the second generation did. What does it say? If Yehoshua had given them rest, he would have not spoken. Do you see why he's saying that, that there's still a rest? Yet Elohim through David says today, This means that Yehoshua bringing the second generation into the promised land was not the ultimate fulfillment of entering into Elohim's rest. It was a type and shadow. Like like we said earlier, what are we waiting to enter into the millennial reign, which is the Sabbath millennial reign, right? It's the Sabbath of the days and it's rest for, for those who obeyed. So there remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of Elohim. This has got nothing to do with keeping the seventh day Sabbath. He's drawing a parallel about entering into what Yah has promised for us. Again, this was written after the death, resurrection and ascension of Messiah. So this idea that Messiah's death somehow changed the law, it it doesn't go with the rest of the context. For the one having entered into his rest has himself also rested from his works as Elohim rested from his own. Let us therefore do our utmost to enter into that rest. That implies that we've not yet entered it. So again, this thing of Jesus is my Sabbath, we've not even entered into that rest yet. Lest anyone fall after the same example of a disobedience. He's saying if you disobey, you can fall short. The rest is entering into Elohim's kingdom, just as the Israelites entered into the promised land. And the kingdom was the ultimate fulfillment. This is why he says if Yehoshua, Joshua, still had, he said that he hadn't brought them into that rest yet. For the word of Elohim is living and working and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even to the dividing of being and spirits and of joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So he's telling you, like, after he's saying, look, don't disobey, don't disobey, why? Because the word, it will reveal you. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all are naked and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom is is our account. This is, he's, look, obey, obey, obey. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, who now understands where we come from because he lived what we lived, Yeshua, the son of Elohim, let us hold fast our confession. This means that when Yeshua gives the sentence, it's a righteous judgment because he's, he's walked a mile in our shoes, so to speak. He became a man. He was tempted like we were. That means his decision, when it will be righteous. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tried in all respects as we are, apart from sin. Basically, we we can't say to him, well, you don't know what it's like. He does. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of favor in order to receive compassion and find favor for timely help. You're probably thinking, where's Melchizedek? I'm laying the foundations for when we get to Melchizedek. We understand it. It's all going to come together in the second half. Chapter 5. This chapter shows us how one becomes a priest by the calling of Elohim and not by his own doing. Uh, he, he, now he's going to start com- uh, contrasting the Levitical priesthood with that of Yeshua. 
For every priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in matters relating to Elohim to offer both gifts and offerings for our sins, being able to have a measure of feeling for those not knowing and being led astray, since he himself is also surrounded by weakness. And on account of this, he has to offer for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. So now he's saying the Levitical priests, they have to offer sin offerings for themselves as well, because they're fallen as well. And no one obtains this esteem for himself, but he who is called by Elohim, even as Aharon also was. So now he's saying, you don't get to make yourself a priest. You are called to that position. Aharon was called. It then became a a genealogy from Aharon. So also the Messiah did not extol himself to become high priest, but it was said to him, you are a son today. I have brought you forth. And he says all oh, in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order, so by my decree, O Melchizedek. So here he's, he's drawing from Psalms to be able to say that Yeshua was by an oath, was made priest. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and petitions with strong crying and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his reverent fear. Though being a son, he learned obedience by what he suffered. So we covered this. You are a priest forever according to the order of, that it's by my decree. We, we covered the Hebrew. However, the book of Hebrews was written in Greek. And the writer quotes more so from the Septuagint than he does from the Masoretic. So what does the Greek say as to the order of? The word is taxis, Um, that's the root. An arrangement in which someone or something functions, an arrangement, a nature, a manner, a condition, an outward aspect. So does it say like, uh, we we have this idea of an organization or a guild? Do you you see what I'm trying to say, like a group of people? No, it's saying a manner, a nature, a likeness. In this way, by the way, this is a quote from BDAG, which is like a, um, it's a dictionary. It's basically Strong's on steroids. Um, in this way, Hebrews understood Psalm 109.4, that's the Septuagint numbering, which the author interprets to mean that Yeshua is a high priest. So the Greek says, uh, kat, uh, I'm not even going to say that, kataton taxin Melchizedek, according to the nature i.e. in the likeness of Melchizedek, like him. It wasn't saying that Melchizedek had an order, uh, uh, he had a lineage of priests. It it was the Greek has this idea that Yeshua was a priest like Melchizedek was a priest. Again, there's no order of. The confusion comes because this word in Greek can also mean an order because it was used of like battalions and things like that. So it, it's because of the ambiguity of the Greek that we get this order of. The he, it's not in the Hebrew. And, the, and as we're going to see, he, the book of Hebrews does not mean it as an order, a lineage of. It means in the likeness of. Uh, like the type of arrangement made for the functioning. Uh, so it functions in a similar way. And we're going to cover these references In any case, the reference is not only to the higher rank, but also to the entirely different nature of Melchizedek's priesthood as compared to that with Aharon. We're going to see that there's a contrast. This is what the Levitical priesthood is, and this is what this other priesthood is. And that Yeshua's priestly functioning is like that of Melchizedek. Do you see the difference? It's subtle, but it really changes the understanding. The end of the previous chapter and the beginning of this chapter speaks of how we as believers need to move from the milk of the word and move on to the meat. You know, the, the, the foundational stuff of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection and all that. Also, the writer shows the sureness of blessing that Abraham was given and how we can attain in a, by following up and how we can attain it by following our forerunners. So let, let's see what he says. For Elohim, having promised Avraham, since he could swear by no one greater, swore by himself, saying, truly, blessing I shall bless you, and increasing I shall increase you. 
And so after being patient, he obtained the promise. For men do indeed swear by the one greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. In this way, Elohim resolving to show even more clearly that the heirs of promise, which is hopefully us, the unchangeableness of his purpose, confirmed it by an oath. So that by two unchangeable matters in which it is impossible for Elohim to lie. So he swears by himself because he's the greatest thing and it's impossible for Yah to lie. So this is a promise and you can rest on that promise. We might have strong encouragement, we who have fled for refuge, to lay hold of the expectations set before. So he's writing to a people that are in refuge. They've ran, what was going on at the time? Those of the faith were persecuted by Rome and by the Jews. It, it was murder out there. Which we have as an anchor for life, both safe and firm, and entering that within the veil where Yeshua has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the likeness, the nature of Melchizedek. So again, let's put the correct understanding, according to the nature of Melchizedek, according to the likeness. Not that you, we have this idea of Yeshua or Melchizedek, and then all these people from falling from under him sort of thing, and that it's like this, you know, a pyramid scheme almost. And it's not saying that. This implies that Yeshua is not Melchizedek. He has be, Yeshua has become a high priest in the likeness of Melchizedek, the, the Melchizedek of Genesis 14. If, he, if someone is like someone, are they one and the same? No. So now we, we can see that the writer of Hebrews does not think Melchizedek is Yeshua. Not the Melchizedek of Genesis 14 anyway. Let's take a break here and then we're going to keep on with the book of Hebrews. We, I, I've stopped it here because all the meat is in the next few chapters. All of this is foundational and then we're going to tie it all together. Amen. Okay, so let's continue where we left off at the end of the first half, where we were kind of slowly working our way through the book of Hebrews. Because as we're going to see, all of this is foundation for the author's grand finale, so to speak. He's going to make a really big point to put the, the recipients of this letter at rest, with, even though that there's imp impending destruction of the temple. So, Hebrews 7 is where we got to. This chapter shows us how Melchizedek is a type and shadow of Yeshua as our high priest and shows how this priesthood is superior to that of the Levitical priesthood. Now we get to the nitty gritty, to the meat of the message. Verse 1, for this Melchizedek, so this is speaking of the guy in Genesis 14, sovereign of Shalem, priest of the Most High Elohim, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the sovereigns and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, his name being translated indeed, first, sovereign of righteousness, so that's Melech Tzadik, and then also sovereign of Shalem, that is, sovereign of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, neither having, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but having been made like the son of Elohim, remains a priest for all time. So this is the main um, verse that people will use to say that Yeshua is Melchizedek because he has no father, no mother, no genealogy. See, clearly, it's talking of Messiah. Now, we've already gone how in the first half, the writer said that Yeshua was like, uh, in the likeness of Melchizedek, implying that Yeshua was not Melchizedek. So let's tackle this little ditty. The writer compares Yeshua's lack of genealogy to that of Melchizedek's, not to imply that Melchizedek was literally without father or mother. Rather, the author uses the silence in the text 
to show that Melchizedek had no priestly genealogy, as was required by the Aaronic and Levitical priests to support his claim to priesthood. This is going to become more apparent now as we go through chapter 7. How did a Levite become a priest? Well, the, the, by birth, they were born into it. The only one that was called was Aharon, and his sons, by default, were priests. Now, what did we say? We're going to cover this, but how was Yeshua made a priest? By my decree, you are a priest. The, the Levites were, they just were. It was a birth thing. And we're going to see the author is going to start contrasting the Levitical and this other priesthood. Yeshua is not portrayed as the successor to Melchizedek, rather that every feature of significance of Melchizedek's priesthood is present in Yeshua's, i.e. in the likeness of, but it's on a much grander scale in Yeshua's, because Yeshua literally didn't, well, did Yeshua have a mother or a genealogy, a father? Yes, he did. So again, this is nothing to do with, do you see the point I'm trying to make? So let's look at this. Look, it says, but having been made like the son of Elohim, remains a priest for all time. Melchizedek, who was made like the son of Elohim. It doesn't say he was the son of Elohim. He was made like him. Melchizedek was made like in order to foreshadow the traits of Yeshua, is what I'm implying. Because do we read of Melchizedek's genealogy? No. It is Yeshua, not Melchizedek, who is the reality. Now, this is where people get mixed up because they say that Melchizedek was Yeshua. But here he's clearly saying that Melchizedek was made like the son of Elohim. And what did we go through in chapter 1? Yeshua, greater than all the angels, he was exalted to the right hand of the Father. This is the point. Let's remember Genesis 14.8, that Melchizedek, sovereign of Shalem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High El, which implies that he isn't now. The, if you think I'm stretching, again, context goes both ways. It comes before the statements, it also comes after. Now see how great this one was, to whom even the ancestor Abraham gave a tenth of the choices booty. And truly those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a command to receive tithes from the people according to the Torah, that is, from their brothers, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. However, the one whose genealogy is not derived from them. See, this is this genealogy without genealogy because he's saying that Melchizedek is not of the genealogy of Levi, of Levi. This answers the without genealogy. He was a priest, not by birth, but but he was called to it. This one received tithes from Abraham and blessed the one who held the promises. So now he's going to make a point to, let's keep going. And it is beyond all dispute that the lesser is blessed by the better. So Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek. Therefore, he's implying that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. And here it is, men who die, want, who die that receive tithes, i.e. the Levites, but there it is, someone of whom it is witnessed that he lives. And one might say that through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, gave tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So we can see the author showing the superiority of the priesthood of Melchizedek, over that of the Levitical by saying, well, look, you know, if Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek and Levi is of Abraham, essentially Levi was giving to Melchizedek. This is not about doing away, by the way, of the Levitical priesthood, and this will become more apparent. Remember that the temple is about to be destroyed. He's trying to give peace to his subjects that are receiving this letter. The people need hope. This is what this is about, hope. The people need to know that sin can still be atoned for. And this becomes very apparent as we go through. Now, this needs to be done in accordance to Torah. Because it's all well and good for the writer of Hebrews to say, oh yeah, you've got this high priest, show me it in Torah. 
And this is what the writer is trying to do. He's showing a precedent in Torah that sin can be dealt with apart from the Levitical priesthood. Now this, again, it helps to understand what even the Levitical priesthood was responsible for, uh, to which we are going to in the millennial temple teaching. But we'll, we'll get into this a bit as we go on. Truly then, now here we get to the crux, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people were given the Torah, why was there still need for another priest to arise according in the likeness of Melchizedek and not to be called according to the likeness of Aharon? I.e., why do we need another priest aside from the Levitical priesthood? For the priesthood being changed of necessity that takes a place, a change of law also. Now, people will say, there you go, the law was changed. And what they mean by that is that the law was done away with. What are we talking about? Priesthoods. We're not talking about Torah. We're talking about priesthoods now. What are we contrasting? The Levitical priesthood and this other priesthood. People will use this verse to say the law has been changed or done away with. Let's just keep reading. Again, context goes both ways. For he of whom it is said belongs to, from a, to another tribe from which no one has attended at the altar. So what tribe did Yeshua come from? Judah. Judah. For it is perfectly clear that our master arose from Yehuda, a tribe about which Moshe never spoke of concerning priesthood. And this is clearer still, if another priest arises in the likeness, ooh, it actually says it outright here, in the likeness of Melchizedek. Up until this point, we've just had in the order of, the order. But here it, com it just comes out. It's not about an order, it's about a similitude. Who has become, not according to the Torah of fleshly command, but according to the power of an endless life. So not because of... The Torah dictates how the Levitical priests were to be who they were. It was by birth. But this is a different way. For he does witness, you are a priest forever according to the likeness of Melchizedek. This is how Yeshua gets to be a priest. Not by genealogy, but by an oath. The change of law does not mean that the Torah is done away with. It simply means that a priest in the likeness of Melchizedek becomes a priest differently than that of a Levitical priest. Because this is the contrast. He's contrasting two ideas. Everyone with me so far? For there is indeed a setting aside of the former command because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the Torah perfected nothing, but in the bringing in of a better expectation through which we draw near to Elohim. There you go. The Torah was weak. It was unprofitable. It perfected nothing. It was to no avail. It's right. What are we talking about? Priesthoods. Priesthoods. This becomes abundantly clear as we keep going. There you go. <laughs> Is this what the writer is actually saying, that the Torah has been done away with, that it's weak? No. We're talking about priesthoods here. Priesthoods. And he's going to make that point clear. And indeed, those that became, why? Those that became priests were many, because they were prevented by death from continuing. So we, we have a death problem occurring. But he, because he remains forever, why? Because it's Yeshua, he's immortal, has an unchangeable priesthood. He lives forever, not like the priests. Therefore, he is also able to save completely those who draw near to Elohim through him, ever living to make intercession for them. The point he's making is that a, a Levitical priest could not do his job forever. However, Messiah can. He's already gone to great lengths to show the majesty and power of Messiah in chapter 1 and beginning of chapter 2. If Messiah lives forever, so does his atoning work as a high priest. That's the point of it. Because Yeshua lives forever, the work he does is forever. This is how, by the way, the Levitical priesthood was weak. It's a weakness in the Levitical... And is it the priesthood that's weak? No, it's the men. It's the men, because they die. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest... 
kind, innocent, undefiled, having been separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens, who does not need, as those high priests, to offer up slaughter offerings day by day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. For this he did once and for all when he offered himself up. Like even the high priest in the Levitical priesthood, before he did the Day of Atonement, he had to offer a bull for himself. So the, the, the priests themselves were defiled, which implies that their atoning work cannot be complete. It's not perfect. However, Messiah it is undefiled and he lives forever. For the Torah appoints as high priest men who have weakness. See, now it's, so th- this earlier statement that we had that the Torah perfected nothing, it was weak, it's because of the high priest who have weakness. But the word of the oath, which came after the Torah, which is what, see, what did it say in Psalm? You are a priest forever by my decree, by what I have spoken, O righteous king. He's just saying here, but the word of the oath, This is that oath. You are a priest forever by my decree, O righteous king. This oath came after the Torah, the son having been perfected forever. Are we with together on this? Because Psalm 110 was written after the Torah was given. What this is saying is that one of the reasons the Levitical priesthood was weak was that the earthly high priest had to offer sacrifices for their own sins, and they were mortal, which means their atoning work goes with them. Yeshua is sinless and lives forever. Thus, his priesthood is an eternal and unchanging one. Men change to and fro, right? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This means the effect of his atonement for sins is everlasting. Let's remember that the temple was about to be destroyed. Therefore, the Yom Kippur service couldn't even be done. Like that, the, and it hadn't even been accepted for 40 years by this point. Well, almost 40 years. So there's a problem. that Sin needs to be dealt with, especially without a temple, because they, they can see the Romans surrounding it. This is reiterated in chapter 10. Let's quickly jump there. For the Torah, having a shadow of the good matters to come and not the image itself of the matters, was never able to make perfect those who draw near with the same slaughter offerings which they offer continually year by year. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? If if the sacrificial system truly took away sin, you could offer one offering, job done. But no, it, it didn't deal with the sin issue. What did the sacrificial system do? It enabled you to draw near. What else did it deal with? Ritual impurity. Sin defiles you. If you sinned, you became defiled. The the sacrificial system, that famous verse, that if the blood of calves was for the perfecting of the flesh. Because those who served, once cleansed, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But he's going to make a point. But in those offerings, there's a reminder of sins year by year. They had to offer Yom Kippur every year. They had to do daily sin offerings. That was a reminder. That was telling them that, look, this system is not dealing with the root cause. It's dealing with the symptom, not the cause, if that makes sense. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So he's trying to remind them, guys, look, I know you're putting your faith in this temple, but remember, it never dealt with sin in the first place. And indeed, every high priest stands day by day doing service and repeatedly offering the same slaughter offerings, which are never able to take away sins. But he, Yeshua, having offered one slaughter offering for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of Elohim, waiting from that time onward until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. For one, by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being set apart. I love that. You are in the process of being set apart. We've not made it yet. Can we see now how the old system was weak and unprofitable? Because this one is far superior. The author is reminding his audience that the Levitical priesthood couldn't cleanse the consciousness. It could only cleanse the flesh. We'll get this verse coming up in a bit. 
Yeah, it could only cleanse the flesh. So, let's jump back to Hebrews 8. This chapter is literally just a brief summary of what we've discussed so far. Now, the summary of what we are saying is, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the greatness in the heaven. So he's not even here on earth. He's sat at the right hand and who serves in the set-apart place and of the true tent, which Yah set up and not man. So now he's reminding them, this temple is not the, it's not the reality, it's the shadow. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and slaughters. So it was also necessary for this one to have somewhat to offer. For if indeed he were here on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the Torah. This is another statement that tells you that the Levitical priesthood is still in operation. Who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly, as Moshe was warned when he was about to make the tent. For he said, see that you make all according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. He's reminding the audience, this is just a shadow. The shadow fades until the real one comes in. Hebrews 9. Th this is where it gets really interesting. We're going to start connecting everything now. This chapter shows Yeshua's duties as a high priest in the heavenly temple in the context of the Day of Atonement. So now we're going to link atonement to this. Now, the first indeed had regulations of worship and the earthly set-apart place. For a tent was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand and the table and the showbread, which is called the set-apart place. After the second veil, the part of the tent which is called most set apart. Now, the Greek for this is hagia hagion, literally holy of holies is the literal translation. The holiest of the holies is another way of putting it. Bear that in the back of your mind. So after the second veil, the part which is called the most holy place, to which belonged the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that held the manna and the rod of Aharon that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Now in some English translations, it will say the altar of incense instead of the golden censer. Now, what's the, where does the golden censer normally stay? In which bit, where, on what? implement it's on the, the the golden censer is usually on the altar of incense where is that altar of incense in the tabernacle it's outside in the it's in the holy place you have the showbread on one side the menorah on the other and then you have the censer and then you have the curtain into the holy of holies now who can spot the problem the golden censer where is it it's after the second veil. In the Holy of... When does that golden censer get to be in that place of the temple? Yom Kippur, once a year. What did the priest have to do? The high priest. He comes in, he takes some ashes and some of the incense, and he takes the set, and then he goes through the curtain, and the incense protects him from the glory of Yah. In there. That's the only time that the golden censer goes into the Holy of Holies. So already this is telling you this is a Yom Kippur uh, scene going on. And this becomes even clearer as we keep going. And above it, the cherubim of esteem were overshadowing the place of atonement about which we do not now speak in detail. This statement, it's almost like, oh yeah, there's a really cool thing here, but I'm not going to go into it because I'm on something else right now. It's like, just tell me... <laughs> And these having been prepared like this, the priest always went into the first part of the tent, ac accomplishing its services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and the sins of ignorance of the people. So it's telling you, this is Yom Kippur. This is why the golden censer is inside the second veil. The set-apart spirit signifying this, that the way into, okay, it's in the English it was say into the most, the holy of holies, was not made yet manifest with the first tense has standing. It doesn't say that. It says in the holy place. It's the same in the Hebrew, by the way. You, I, you get 
uh, Kodesh put twice for the uh, Holy of Holies, but only once for the outside place. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, it's common teaching that we, as priests of Melchizedek, are allowed now into the spiritual Holy of Holies. It doesn't say this. It says there's a difference between the holy place and the holy of holies. Who is the only person, according to Torah, that's allowed in that holy of holies? The high priest. So does Yah now go back on his word and says, oh yeah, just waltz on in? No. The set of, we'll get more on this. We'll get, leave that in the back of your mind. But what, okay, this ties into when Yeshua died, what happened in the temple? A, a, a curtain tore. Which one? Did you know there was more than one curtain? We, well, we just read it. It says in the previous slide, after the second veil. So we've already got two veils in the tabernacle. In the temple, there was actually four veils. But what, which one tore? Everyone says it was the one of the Holy of Holies. You wouldn't have been able to see that happen if it was the one in the Holy of Holies. Where Yeshua was crucified, you could see the temple gate. And that, that veil was outside that temple door. People would have seen it from the mount, that veil tearing. This is really important because people, they do this in ignorance. You know what I mean? That, oh yeah, we get to go into the high, No, you don't. Only the high priest does. Who's our high priest? This will become, again, more apparent as we keep going. Which was a parable for the present time Okay, so what was the parable? Uh, the second veil, the high priest, only went in once a year, not without blood. The set-apart spirit signifying that the way into the holy place, the sanctuary, where the showbread and the menorah are, was not yet made manifest while the first tent has a standing, which was a parable for the present time in which both gifts and slaughters are, are offered, which are unable to perfect the one serving as to his conscience. Nothing to do with the flesh, to his conscience. Only as to food and drinks and different washings and fleshly regulations imposed until a time of setting matters straight. The author of Hebrews is saying, because our conscience has, cannot be cleansed by the Levitical offering, we're not allowed into the holy place. Because you are unclean. Your consciousness is defiled. Then that needs to be rectified. And look, he says, it's a parable for the present time. When this was written, this was after the burial death. So put it into context. Let's keep going. Where do we enter into? The holy place or the holy of holies? Where did a priest, where was a priest allowed? The sanctuary. The holy place. Only the high priest gets to go. And, and who is, who, who's the author saying the high priest is? Yeshua. Verse 9 shows us another reason why the Levitical priesthood is inferior to that of Yeshua's, as we're about to see. Because it's unable to perfect your conscience. But Messiah... But Messiah, having become a high priest of the coming good, is the coming good. Which implies it's still not yet fully arrived... Through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, entered into the most set-apart place once and for all, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, having obtained everlasting redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the defiled, sets apart for the cleansing of the flesh... It's telling you there what the, young, uh, what the Levitical priesthood does. It cleanses your flesh, enabling you to draw near to Elohim. This is what we covered in the Millennial Temple teaching in a lot of detail. How much more shall the blood of Messiah, who through the everlasting spirit offered himself and blemish to Elohim, cleanse your conscience, your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? Look, it's telling you that the dead works are what defile your conscience. You have, this means that those that have been cleansed by the blood of Messiah can now actually go into the, 
the set-apart place. It means that a, a priest, the spiritual priesthood, as it were, can now officiate in that. But anyway, this is the main point of the book. These two verses, the main point of the book, the Levitical sacrifices, all they did was cleanse your flesh. So why are you so worried about the temple going bye-bye? It says elsewhere that flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom. Does this weak body inherit? No. You put on incorruption. This is the main point of the book. This is the message of hope to a people whose world is being destroyed right in front of their eyes. Imagine thinking, we're screwed. People would have literally thought that they wouldn't have been able to make it into the kingdom because sin couldn't be dealt with. And the writer is telling them, guys, you're missing the point. There's a better way. It was never about the Levitical priesthood. That's a type and shadow. But the Levitical priesthood cleansed your flesh, not your conscience. For when, according to Torah, every command had been spoken by Moshe to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which Elohim commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels of service. And according to the Torah, almost all is cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Okay, has the writer of Hebrews forgotten about the sacrificial system? In, well, the system in general. What happened if you were too poor to be able to afford an animal? You could give a grain offering. What if you were even... So first it was a pigeon and stuff. But then if you were that poor, you could give a grain offering. And it said that that provided atonement. If that's the case, that's a, verse 22 is a contradiction. Because you can get atoning through a grain offering for the very poor people. So has that been omitted? It doesn't say forgiveness. Well, it kind of does. It doesn't. It's this word again, aphesis. Do you remember how in the, in the first half it talks about the jubilee? You, you shall release everything. You shall release the property. You shall cancel the debt because it is the release of Yah. It's this word, aphesis. And what did we read in the uh, 11 Kumel Kizadek? That there's going to be a jubilee of release from sin not from the release of debt. We have a debt of sin to pay. And this is what this eschatological jubilee is going to release us from. What they were essentially saying is that the jubilee on the physical was just a type and shadow of the greatest jubilee yet to occur. Is this word. So this is why I say we have a, uh, an erroneous understanding of forgiveness. Because the idea we have is like, oh, boom, it's gone. Boom, it's gone. You're released from it. It held you down. It condemned you to death. You've been set free. This is why you need to be redeemed. You need to be bought. Because this, does that make more sense? Again, you shall set the 50th year apart and proclaim aphesis, release, throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. At the end of every seven years, you make aphesis, a release. And it, this is the word of the release. Every creditor is to release what he has loaned his neighbor. He does not require it of his neighbor or his brother because it is called the aphesis, the release, the jubilee. And this is where Messiah quotes it. He comes to Nazareth, to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And according to his practice, he went into the congregation on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And being, having un unrolled the scroll, he found the place where it is written. I, well, this is Isaiah 61, what we've just covered. The spirit of Yah is upon me because he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to send away the crushed ones with a release. If you look in your strongs right now in Luke 4, and look at this word, it's aphesis, the very same word used that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Same word. So it's the English translation that's 
hiding this, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yah. So where it says here, according to the Torah, almost all is cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no release. It changes it. This passage is better understood as saying that without the shedding of blood, there is no jubilee release and no eschatological day of Yom Kippur. This statement, chapter 9, 22, is in the context of, we've just gone through the description of the day of Yom Kippur. It's in that context. He describes how the censer is in the Holy of Holies and how the high priest only went in once a year. And then he says, without the shedding of blood, there is no release because that's when the Jubilee was declared. By the way, this is, ties in to when it says, how good, how good um, on the feet are those who proclaim good news, who proclaim release, tie it all together. This keeps in flow with the earlier context of chapter 9 describing the regulations of Yom Kippur. Without the blood of Messiah, you cannot be released from sin. We understand that, but not in the context of the Jubilee. This also corresponds to what we have covered in regards to 11Q Melchizedek. Are people connecting it? Let's keep going. It was necessary then that the copies of the heavenly ones should be cleansed with these, but the heavenly ones themselves with better slaughter offerings than these. For Messiah has not entered into the set-apart place made by hand, figures of the true, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Elohim on our behalf, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the set-apart place, year by year with blood, not his own. For if so, he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the offering of himself. It's interesting, he has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages. Upon, and we're in the end of the ages. Upon, and as it awaits men to die once, and after this, the judgment So also the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time, apart from sin, on those waiting for him unto deliverance. Amen, yes. Just as the earthly tabernacle was inaugurated with blood, so the heavenly tabernacle had to be. The difference being with a once and for all sin offering. Once and for all. This is how the old command was weak and unprofitable. Nothing to do with the Torah, everything to do about priesthoods. Hebrews 10. This passage continues to expand on the superiority of Yeshua being the high priest compared to that of the Levitical priesthood. For the Torah having a shadow of the good matters to come and not the image itself of the matters was never able to make perfect those who draw near with the same slaughter offerings which they offer continually year by year. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because those who served once cleansed would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those offerings is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And indeed, every, high pr- every priest stands day by day doing service and repeatedly offering the same slaughter offerings which are never able to take away sin. But he, having offered one slaughter offering for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of Elohim, waiting from that time onward until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being set apart. All time. The Hebrews could rest at peace knowing that their conscience could be atoned for, even if the physical temple had been destroyed. They've been reminded, look, the Levitical priest couldn't cleanse your conscience. Now they can go forward in peace. Yes, it's sad to see the temple go. It is sad. And it was a sign of judgment upon Yah's people. But there was still hope. This is the whole crux of the book of Hebrews. To give hope to a people that are being judged. The people had forgotten that the physical is a shadow of the spiritual. We get so caught up in the shadow picture sometimes and do this and don't do that. Losing sight of what it's trying to teach you. 
It is the spiritual that is the reality, not the physical. Just as Yeshua is the reality, not Melchizedek. So, brothers, having boldness to enter into the set-apart place, the holy place, the Hagion, that's the first part. This is where you get to go in. By the blood of Yeshua, you can now come and do service in where the bread is and where the menorah is. And this is interesting because you have the altar of incense there. What does the smoke represent in Revelation? The incense. I'm here murmuring. The prayer of the saints. That means you can now come into the temple and offer up your prayer. You were defiled before that. By a new and living way which he has instituted for us through the veil, the first veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of Elohim, let us draw near with a true heart in completeness of belief, having our hearts sprinkled from a wicked conscience and our bodies washed with clean water. Note the need for both the conscience and the body needed to be cleansed so that you can then enter into the set-apart place with boldness. You don't get to go into the Holy of Holies. That's for you, sure. We don't deserve that. We're, we're, we're not able to. But now that Yeshua has done what he's done, look, this is my um, belief, but the bride will have access. When a bride is married to a king, does she get to see her king? Yes. So what happened in the story of Esther? She came to the king, even though she wasn't summoned, something that could be punishable by death, but he showed her favor. Now that we, as the, hopefully we as the bride, we will be able to approach the king unsummoned. I'm going, to, I'm going to go on to this more next week, but this is what Messiah did for you. This is how we can now enter into the holy place, not the holy of holies. We can now come and offer our petition to the king. Let us hold fast to the confession of our expectation without yielding, for he who promised is trustworthy. Why? Because he's, he, he, he is forever and let us be concerned for one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging and so much more as you see the day coming near. The whole point of us meeting together is to encourage one another to have a better judgment day. It is in the context of knowing the totality of what Yeshua did for us that we get this famous passage. For if we sin purposely after we have received the knowledge of the truth, the truth that he's just all gone through at great lengths to expound, there no longer remains a slaughter offering for sins, but some fearsome anticipation of judgment and a fierce fire which is about to consume the opponent's. Anyone who has disregarded the Torah of Moshe dies without compassion on the witness of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has trampled the son of Elohim underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common and insulted the spirit of favor? It's in the context of what we've just covered because people will just use this passage to uh, almost as fear porn you know you will fear and this is what he's doing but it's in the context of everything we've just gone through knowing just the totality of what messiah did only then does this apply for we know him who said vengeance is mine i shall repay says yah and again yah shall judge his people <laughs> it is fearsome to fall into the hands of the living elohim Let's tie it all together. Everything that we've gone through. Yeshua is not Melchizedek. The, the book of Hebrews makes that very clear. Yeshua, Melchizedek was made like Yeshua. Melchizedek was simply a type and shadow of Messiah. The writer of Hebrews is simply using Melchizedek to show a precedent in the Torah for a king priest. Because how can Yeshua provide atoning work 
Because atoning work is the job of a priest. How can he do that if he's from Judah? So the writer is going, guys, you've forgotten about this. That there is a priesthood, this priest aside from the Levitical priesthood. He was forming similar theology to what is found in the Melchizedek scroll that we covered in the first half. So, who was Melchizedek? Da, da, da. Some people will say it's Shem. Now, um, I'm going to set this as your homework task. Go read up on the difference between the dates between the Masoretic and the Septuagint. Yeah, there's a difference in the chronology. We're talking like a 600 odd year difference, right? 650, which means that Shem was dead by the time that this occurred. Now, th- th- that line of thinking is right in one sense, that he was a man. Th- th- it's the common Jewish belief that it was Shem, because obviously they used the Masoretic. They're right that he was a man. I don't think it was Shem. I just think it was a guy who was a king of Shalem, and he was a priest. And that's literally all there is to it. I know sometimes we expect this amazing da 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 da, and sometimes it's really simple. Both Yeshua and Melchizedek, from 11Q Melchizedek, are understood as the subject of Isaiah 61, the, God, the person who's coming in to usher in the release, the aphesis, the eschatological jubilee who enacts enacts a jubilee from sin. Now, Hebrews focuses on its language upon Yom Kippur, therefore the more priestly aspect, whereas 11 Melchizedek focuses on the jubilee itself. Now, these are intrinsically linked scripturally because the jubilee was announced on Yom Kippur. They're saying the same thing, but just coming at it from different angles. Yeshua is a high priest in heaven, right? Now, this is important. This means that we're not part of Yeshua's heavenly priesthood. Why do I say that? Pardon? The meek inherit the earth. We don't go to heaven. The meek inherit the earth. Where is the millennium occurring? Here on earth. This this means that Yeshua, we're not part of the heavenly priesthood. Because people say, oh, I'm a priest according to you. Are you? No. There is no order of Melchizedek, i.e. an organization, uh, a guild, uh, do you know what I mean? Like the Aaronic priesthood. Yeshua's priesthood is in the likeness of Melchizedek. It shares similar um, traits in that it is attained not by genealogy, but that it is by an oath sworn by Elohim. That's how Yeshua, because this is why the writer of Hebrews pulls out Psalm 110. Let's remember as well that the term Melchizedek is not a name, it's a title. Because people... People then say, well, Melchizedek of Genesis 14 is the Melchizedek of Psalm 110. No, it's not. It's a title. We are not Melchizedekian priests in the traditional sense, okay? I'm going to quantify this. Because, first of all, if there's no order of Melchizedek, that means that, well, we can't be part of it because it doesn't exist. We, I'm, I'm, we can be priests, but... You could, it's going to be a thing, oh, well, Michael, you're just getting down to the semantics of it. Um, this is what I'm supposed to do. Nowhere in scripture are we actually told that we are Melchizedekian priests. Please show me book, chapter, verse, where it says, you are a priest according to Melchizedek. You won't find it. I can hear someone murmuring, ah, but what about 1 Peter 2.9? Let's look at 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. It just says it out loud, a set-apart nation. Do I see Melchizedek's name in there? No. 
a people for a possession, that you should proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of Elohim, who had not obtained compassion, but now obtained compassion. So hints to Hosea there. Where is verse 9 quoted from? Where's verse 9 quoted from? The bit that I've underlined. I'll, I'll make it easy. Exodus 19. They're at the foot of Mount Sinai. And now if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. What did we cover in part two? How were Israel meant to be priests when they already had a Levitical priesthood or were going to have one? There's a, what does a priest do? It meets outright ruling. It gives teaching on righteousness. And it's a light unto people. It doesn't say... Look, Peter is not quoting Psalm 110 or... Uh, Genesis 14 he's quoting Exodus this is about the, the, the birth of a nation nothing to do with the order of Melchizedek there are two types of priests here on earth Levitical priests that's obvious other priests I've put and these were the leaders and judges that we covered last week we, in part one, we said we need leaders, we need judges to teach us righteousness, to give us reproof. And then we showed, in part two, how there were Levites and there were other priests. These other priests aren't part of some order, they just are. Does that make sense? They're not part of this secret cabal of, oh, we're the order of this. No, you just aren't. They were just judges. They officiated these were demonstrated by Moshe and Aharon. Perfectly. So what, what did we have with Moses, uh, Aharon? We had Aharon and his children thereafter. We had Moses and the 70. who were. And now there was a crossover in the fact that all of them gave rulings. They meted out righteousness. They meted out right ruling. Okay, how did these other priests act in a priestly function? They meted out our righteousness and right ruling. So um, some of you guys have done this to me, where you've come to me and go, Michael, I don't know what to do about this. What, what should I do according to scripture? And I've given you a ruling. I've, I've acted in the office of priest, just not a Levitical one. This is what the Levites did and the judges. Um, what I'm doing now, right now, is acting in a priestly function because I'm giving to you the word of Yah. I'm expounding on it. I'm therefore, I, I think I mentioned this, but essentially, if I'm speaking the word of Yah as an envoy, I am his voice in this particular instance. I'm not saying I'm the voice of God. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Some of, there's been times where Yah has spoken to me through some of you, and in that moment, you've been the voice of Yah. You've acted as a priest in that moment. This was shining the light of Torah to others. So let's use the analogy. You come to me for, a, you, you need a ruling. I don't know what to do. And I've given you a judgment. It's shed light on the situation. You now know what to do. I've shed the light of Torah. This is what we're supposed to be growing up into. This is what discipleship is all about. They acted as envoys and as the voice of the righteous king. They mediated between man and Elohim in a different way than how the Levites did. There was crossover, but the Levites had a specific function, and that was to do the sacrifices and so forth. We are not Melchizedekian priests in the traditional sense. That's what I'm saying. You can be a priest. We are part of a priesthood, but it's not what is being commonly taught. Because there is no order of Melchizedek. We're in the similitude. We're like him, hopefully. However, we have the ability to become priests like those under Moshe, i.e. the 70 elders. We have that ability to grow and to be tutored. And this is where the laying on of hands comes in. 
Like Moshe's father-in-law, he was a priest. Like the sons of David. The sons of David are a beautiful picture of a royal priestly function because they were sons of the king and they were called king, uh, priests. But elsewhere it says that they were chiefs. It is this priesthood that will rule and reign with Messiah during the millennium. Melchizedek was simply one of these other priests. That's what I'm saying. And he was just the first instance of that happening in scripture. It gave the Torah legal precedent that you can be a priest outside of Levi. He was a king and he was a priest. Just that. Well, I say just that. That's a very high office. The Levitical priesthood was not replaced by another priesthood. Because in the common Christian thinking, you have Melchizedek, Melchizedek. Now let's have the Levites for a while and now let's go back to Melchizedek. And then there's this thing in the millennium, we don't really quite know what to do with it. The two earthly priesthoods worked side by side in the Tanakh. We see that. They will work side by side in the millennium. In the millennium, it's very clear in Ezekiel 40 onwards that there will be sacrifices. There will also be a bride ruling and reigning. Both priesthoods work side by side back then, and they will do so in the millennium. The only reason we don't have a Levitical priesthood now is that we do not have a legitimate physical temple. And I've put legitimate in there because I think there's going to be a temple coming before the rule of Messiah and that is not going to be legitimate. We know that it's Messiah that inaugurates the true temple in the millennium. But that's the only reason we don't have... If we had a legitimate temple, we would have to do Levitical sacrifices. Shock horror. The two earthly priesthoods serve different functions. I'm, I'm, I'm making a, a, a difference because there's two priesthoods here, and we know of Yeshua's priesthood. The Levitical priesthood officiated in sacrifices which only dealt with the cleansing of the flesh. They also acted as teachers and judges, as per Torah. The other earthly priesthood simply acted as teachers, judges, authorities, and in meeting out right ruling. So there's a crossover. The Levites just had an extra function. Not all judges were necessarily Levites, by the way. Some of them were just wise men. Yeshua's heavenly priesthood is for the cleansing of the conscience. Now, like I said, the meek inherit the earth. It is a heavenly priesthood. It is the heavenly counterpart to the Levitical priesthood. Does that make sense? The Levitical cleanses the flesh. The heavenly cleanses the conscience. Both by blood. Both cleanse by blood. If there are two priesthoods here on earth, then there must be two priesthoods in heaven. Right? Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So here we have, on earth, we have Levi, Levi, the cleansing of the flesh, and we have Moshe and the 70 elders. Like I'm using them as a type of shadow. You could, you could put the 12 apostles there if you wanted. Then we have Yeshua and cleansing of the conscience in what we've just gone through a great length in the book of Hebrews. So what's the counterpart to this? Yeshua and the divine counsel. What do the divine counsel do? They should be meeting out righteousness and right ruling. Go read Psalm 82. We see an instance of some in that council going off piste, so to speak. This means that when the millennium is here on earth, our brother Pip said this, that the bride will be the earthly equivalent of the heavenly divine counsel. To me, it's just amazing. This is what Yeshua enabled for his people. This, putting this teaching together, I was just making that connection, seeing the two priesthoods here and the two priesthoods. His will really will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.